folks like Glenn and Donna and David. Let's see. We've got any older ones today. Just the little ones. So Children's Church, all of you little folks head over for that. And if you want to mark in your hymnals, our hymn of invitation this morning is 360, Why Do You Wait? Why Do You Wait? All right. Good looking group heading over for Children's Church, and certainly it's uh, uh, good to see everybody out uh, as we don't need anybody to forecast to you or tell you that it is cold because if you walked up here uh, out of your vehicle, which we all did, you knew that. But it's good to have you with Facebook logging in, uh, YouTube later on. Uh, and certainly it's a privilege for me to be here sharing God's word with you. And uh, just happy to be here on a, another Sunday morning. As for most of us, I'm sure the, the drama uh, of of life, the drama of our politics continues to play out as we watch the news or read the news, however you, you choose to do that. Trials, congressional hearings, prosecutors, judges, those all fill the headlines. Continuing crises overseas, uh, and those building, we hear of those. It's easy to get wrapped up in this stuff. Uh, off of last week's sermon, I thought uh, uh, everyone did a great job. And I think that uh, to kind of bounce off that, I just want to give us some encouragement this morning and uh, want to uh, see that we need to uh, ourselves not get wrapped up because this is obviously an election year. We know things are going to get different, uh, uh, be worse as they draw closer. And uh, we know that a lot of things can, unexpected things can happen as well. But we should never put our trust in a, in a man, a party, a, uh, even a nation as far as that goes, not as Christians, because all of those are made up by humans, and they will fail. They will fail. They will do things they should not do. They will disappoint us. We're going to start off in the book in Psalms. If you want to turn over to Psalms 146, we're going to be in Psalms for most of our sermon this morning. I find this encouraging uh, word for us. Uh, Psalm 146 verse 3 says, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the, son of, in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. No help, he says. Princes, uh, the Son of Man, a human being. That's what he's saying there, not the Son of Man as in Christ. No help, he goes on to say. No comfort, no salvation there. We just talked about salvation with our communion and I think it's good to see that we have God's word to comfort us there's great news great news we have hope uh, we have hope that can never be changed it's always going to be true uh, and it's one thing that man cannot foul up is the truth of God's word with that I want us to think about where our minds are set that's a matter of fact the title of my sermon this morning where is my mind set where is my mind set? Uh, I want you to ask yourself that, that not just today, but throughout the course of this week. Well, there's a lot of things going on, and, and a lot of things that's going on are not bad things. They're just things that distract us. Psalm 37 is where I'd like to, to look. This is one of my favorite passages uh, in the scriptures, one that I've preached on before. But it's also a source of encouragement. And I want to pass that along to you as well. Uh, I'm going to read the first 10 verses of Psalm 37. And we'll go back and look at uh, some of the wisdom in this. David writes here, it says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. And he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. 
Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. A lot of things going on in the world that, that fit to this. For Christians, a lot of good advice there. It's, it's, it's something that, and I encourage you to mark this scripture uh, as we study, I hope it means something to you. If it's not already marked in your Bibles, it's, I have this as one of those that are, that are highlighted that I refer to quite often because of the things that we see go on in the world. And the first thing he starts off this psalm with is, is to not to worry about the corruption, not to worry about the corrupt people. Verses 1 and 2, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. According to who you listen to, one side's corrupt and the other side's not. And the other side's corrupt and, and they're not. Both sides point a finger at each other. And to be honest, all we see is people tearing people apart. And it's not just in this nation. You look around this world, all the world leaders are pointing to corruption, pointing to the corruption. But yet we find that there's most likely corruption every place. It's kind of like the old saying, saying the kettle calling the pot black. Uh, there's plenty of guilt to be handed out for all the parties. They do nothing but harm. That's why they're called corrupt. God's word says what? Notice he uses that word fret. Do not fret. He uses that word several times in this passage. David does. means do not worry or do not be anxious. When we focus on things that's going on around us and not the one who loves us, we fret. We worry. We don't sleep well. We, we eat excessively. We get sick. Why? Why is that? Well, one reason is because of what Paul wrote to the church at Colossus, or Colossae, rather. And, and it's my favorite scripture verse. It's on my business card. It's Colossians 3, 2. And it says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Set our minds on things above. And I think that's pretty much the theme of what we were talking about last Sunday is that we change, we re-engage our focus to set our minds on the things above and not allow our minds to continue to be focused on the things of this earth and service to God and service to our fellow man. So I'd like for you to think that in your mind. You can even recite it with me if you'd like to because you may as well get used to it. I'm going to use that verse several times throughout this sermon. To set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. Let's keep focused on heavenly things. Keep focused on what Jesus taught us. Not the things of the world. Not the things of Satan. And that's what we think about when we think about things of the world. He's the father of lies and all that have to do with that. He's the father of corruption. He's the father of discord. He's the father of hate. He's the father of evil. We see plenty of that going on in the world, and we know who is to blame, who is the father of that, but we know what our Father in heaven, God, gives to us. And that's what David is trying to remind us here in this passage, in this psalm. To spend more time in the Bible, I believe it's good for any of us. We talked about that last week. I put out that challenge to read more and social media less. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands, but I'm going to ask you this. How are you doing? Did you take that challenge? Did you take the challenge of being on your social media platform, whatever it is you choose, half as much time, and you devote that much time to prayer and studying your Bible? And I'll leave that to you to answer. 
and encourage you, just like I said last week, remember, uh, people, we talked about New Year's resolutions, and oftentimes people feel like because they had an early failure that they have failed in their goal. You've not failed in your goal to do that. Choose that to be your goal and move forward to it. And a failure does not mean that you will fail. It just means you've hit a speed bump. So do that. Trust in the Lord is the next thing that David tells us to do here in verses 3 and 4. Trust in the Lord. Do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Don't worry about the corrupt evildoers, he says in the first couple of verses. Trust in the Lord, he says in the next two. How is it that we can do that? By following the example of Jesus is one way. Matter of fact, that's the perfect example. From the beginning of his ministry, he faced opposition, didn't he? He faced those that wanted him to stop, didn't want him, wouldn't recognize him as Messiah, wanted to do everything that they could to stop him from doing uh, what he was doing, what God the Father had sent him to do. Same way with getting caught up in the politics of the day. Just let them fight and fuss. There's nothing that I can worry about, nothing that I can do other than I am, can do what I can do as a citizen of these United States. I can go cast my one vote in good conscience. That's what I can do as a citizen to change what's going on in this world. That's my contribution. And I'm not diminishing that. I think that's a great honor and I think it's a great responsibility. But I can do so many more things as a Christian to change the outcome of my life, to change the outcome of other people's lives. We'll go over some of those things, and that's what I want to encourage us to start thinking about doing things a little differently. I want to put out another challenge for you today. Let them do all of the fussing and the fighting and the wrangling and the name calling and this kettle is black and that pot is black. Let them do that. They're going to do that. Nothing that you and I can do will change what they do. But we can change what we do. We can change what people see us. Let's love God. Remember what Jesus taught us? Love God with all of our heart and our strength and our soul and our mind. Love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Continue to study more. Pray more. Have more compassion toward the needy. Again, read your Bibles more. Here's some things that I want to challenge us to do. Now, I realize that some of us are going to be able to do all of these things. Some of us will only be able to do maybe one of those things on this list. But we can all do something. And, and I want to encourage you to do that. And if you're already doing one of these activities, add the other activity. This is my challenge and my encouragement for you for the coming weeks in the coming year. I want us to one time a week, as we start off taking baby steps, to do a Jesus activity, I'm gonna call it. Rob, what are you talking about? I want us to do something that we would expect to see Jesus do if he were walking upon the earth. I wanna do something that we can follow after the example of Christ in the scriptures and do it ourselves. Lord, what's he want me to do? <laughs> It's simple. We can have compassion on people. We can love. Well, how can I do that, Rob? Well, I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and these are just some things. It's not the only thing. We're not limited to these things. There's a food box right down the street at another church where people regularly get food. People who are hungry get food. Go to the dollar store. I challenge you, go to the dollar store. Stop by the grocery store, pick up an extra can of green beans, corn, maybe spaghetti and meatballs, some type of canned food, drop in that box. You're going to help feed the hungry. Jesus would have us to do that, wouldn't he? That's a Jesus activity. We can help feed someone who needs food. We have prayer lists. There's all kinds of prayer lists that goes around on social media. That's one good thing I like about it, prayer requests. I want you to pick one person this week. 
one person, pray for them specifically and their needs specifically. Not saying that you don't pray for others, but I want you to devote more time to that one individual, speak to God on their behalf, call them by name, and pray for them, and pray for whatever situation you know is going on in their life. But didn't Jesus do that? Didn't he pray that God would, would protect and in, in bur encourage and embolden and watch over those who followed him? That's a Jesus activity. That's a Jesus activity as well. Do something nice for a stranger. I'm not saying you go bonk them in the head with the Bible. Do something nice for a stranger this week. Don't have to be anything big. Hold the door open for a stranger. Do something nice for a stranger this week. You might get the opportunity to share Christ with them. You may not, and that's fine. Because you know what you've done? You've still done something nice for someone you didn't know, and maybe you've uplifted their week. Those are Jesus activities. Now, you can come up with your own to do. But I want us to, the only way we can get out of this mindset where we look at what goes on around us and we're affected so bad, because we can't change it. Remember, I mean, I realize we all got to vote. Well, how many we've got here? 50 some, I would imagine. So there's 50 votes in this room. And that's the extent of our able to affect what goes on in our country around us. But there is 50 opportunities for however many people are here and, and however many people are watching. There are 50 opportunities to be like Jesus this week. Now, that's awesome because that is 50 opportunities to change someone's life, even if it's just for a day, for someone to say, hey, that was nice that someone opened the door. Someone is able to go get food when it's, they're hungry. Someone to hear that, hey, I've been praying for you. You don't have to call and tell them. Maybe you don't want to make themselves them uncomfortable. But usually I have found when people are in a bad situation and they need prayer, they like to know that people have prayed for them. But I'm not saying you have to call them and, or text them or whatever and let them know that you're praying. But it's nice to know. So I, I, that's my challenge for this week. That's my challenge for this week. Do some type of Jesus act. Oh, here's another one. Call, and I'm going to let you do, I'm going to give you an out here. Call or text someone that you have not spoke to in a while, that you know comes to church, and they've not been here in a while. Just give them a text. Give them a quick call on the phone. Just check up on them. It's our job to let other people know that we miss them and that we want them to be here with us when they can be. Again, if we all do that, if we all check up on somebody that we've not seen in a while, that's 50 people that's going to be contacted. Now, it could be that they're contacted twice, some people are. I'll give you that. But let's just go with 40 then. Think about the impact. That's 40 people that receives a phone call or a text that we wouldn't have otherwise done that just to check on somebody. That's my weekly challenge for you going throughout this year. And you're going to have good ideas too for activities that I just didn't put down. Add those in there. That's how we change this world and we change what's going on around us because that's what we have the power to do because Jesus gave us the examples to do that. He gave his disciples those examples and they followed them and that's how they impacted the world. And that's what I want to encourage us to do. The next part he says, verses 5 and 6, commit. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Was any of that stuff I just mentioned too hard, by the way, before I get into this? Was any of that unreasonable? You know what the difference, and I'm not, I'm going to stomp a toe here. 
The only thing that will hold you back from doing a Jesus activity this week is your desire to do a Jesus activity. Because that's not hard stuff to do. And I want you to just let, let that settle and think. Because it's just the truth. I'm not being mean. I don't mean to stomp your toe if I am. But that's the only thing that stops us from doing that. Because there's things where you don't have any contact at all with somebody. Putting the food in the box. To where you can go all the way up and, and have a lot of contact with somebody by calling them up. So there's a broad range there. Do you have the desire to be like Jesus, which we're called to do? This thing. Commit yourselves, he said in 5 and 6. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Commit. Commit. Anybody have Peacock streaming TV? I didn't, we didn't get to watch Kansas City Miami football game yesterday. Fourth coldest game in NFL history. At game time, it was minus four degrees. Throughout the game, there was 25 mile an hour winds, which dropped that down to 27, minus 27 degrees on the field. As best as I could figure when I was doing the research, there was 76,000 fans that packed Arrowhead Stadium to watch that football game in that kind of weather. How many people would have went to hear the gospel preached in that kind of weather? None. You might have got 76. <laughs> you sure wouldn't have got 76,000. How many people are committed enough just to come to a warm building on a cold January day? If we had the kind of commitment to our sports teams, or even politics, I'll go so far as to say, we had that kind of commitment inside of our churches, that kind of commitment to serving the Lord, there'd be no problems on this planet. You realize that, don't you? There'd be no problems. Commit yourself. Commit yourself. Commit means being dedicated. We often use that word to describe a, a relationship between a husband and a wife or an employee and an employer. Uh, we do that with folks that go above and, and beyond and do what we think is right in their roles. But we need first and foremost to be committed to God. Seek the kingdom of God first. And then all these things shall be added unto you. What things? Food, clothing, shelter. The things that we need. The things that we must have. And that's what God promises us. We'll see that a little later on here in this, one of my most encouraging scriptures whenever we get worried for me, when I get worried or concerned. I don't want to use the word worry because there's a great deal of difference. I can have concern and not so much be worried. Worry is something that goes on and on and on, and I can't affect things. Now, I'm concerned. There's a good way to break this out. I, I can be concerned about what's going on in this country, but I am not worried about what's going on in this country because I put my trust in God. So, Commit our life to seeking out God first. Let him add to our lives the things that we need. Set our mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Good works to live by. I didn't write them. I'm just reading them. But I really like them. Seven and eight. Rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Rest. Something that you see a lot of times with, with, and you hear a lot, and I'm not diminishing these statements. I don't know how people make it through blank without the Lord. They don't have rest. They get through, but they don't have peace and rest. That's the difference. They don't have that comfort, that, 
peace that passeth all understanding, they don't have it. They have turmoil in their heart. They have turmoil in their life. They have worry. They have anguish. They have despair. They don't have what David writes about here is the rest. We're called to wait on the Lord with patience. Jesus is coming back. We must have patience. We don't have to worry about the other guy. They, he don't have peace or rest. We can always find somebody that's got more toys, bigger house, nicer car, uh, meaner dog, whatever you want to compare it to, than I've got. But would I trade it for the rest that I have in the Lord versus that they don't have that rest? Absolutely not. I want my rest, my peace of mind that I have. I wouldn't trade any possession in the world for that. And when we look at people in that light, then we need to kind of adjust it in our minds. Well, what would we be willing to trade? Who are you comparing yourself to, in other words? Someone that doesn't have a relationship with God? We don't want that, do we? Well, I'd like to have all that that guy's got. All that means, if they don't have a relationship with God, you trade your relationship with God for worldly possessions. Is that what we're talking about? Seek out that rest. Seek out the rest. Set your mind on things above and not on things of this earth. Cease from anger, he says. Forsake wrath. Do, don't fret. Anger, extreme anger, worry. God's telling us to stop it. Why? It causes harm. No good comes from it. Only harm. Uh, actual or, here's some definitions. Actual or potential ill effect or danger. Damage of the health. Having an adverse effect on health. I went back and looked. Uh, WebND and did a couple of other cross-references. Here are the effects of anger, both short-term and long-term, on the human body. Uh, insomnia, heartburn, digestive issues and problems. It builds to anxiety and then depression. And then longer-term, high blood pressure. Here's one I didn't even think about, eczema because of the stress and then eventually it can build to a heart attack or a stroke and worry if you go back and look worry has very closely the same things that's short term and long term effects on the body but yet how much time do we spend worrying about things that we can do nothing about instead of actively pursuing the things that I can do something about to the detriment of my health, both mental and physical. And that's what I want to encourage us to do. Let's recognize what we can do and do it. Worrying about all of this that's going on or they say that's going on or things that's happened in the past, things that may happen in the future, I cannot change those things one iota, but I can change what I do. And I can serve God. And I can help someone else along the way because it's bad for my health if I get mad over this stuff. It's bad for my health if I worry. Now, there's a difference, as I said. There's a difference in concern and worry. Nothing wrong with being concerned about a situation. Worry is where the problem comes in. Saw a funny thing on Facebook yesterday as I was scrolling through the church page getting ready to do the the announcement for the sermon it says, tell people there's a winter storm coming and they will get prepared. Tell people that Jesus is coming and they will do nothing to get prepared. If you went out to Lowe's or Walmart or any place yesterday, people was getting prepared, wasn't they? I don't care what grocery store you was at. I don't care. I don't know what was going on at Lowe's, but I went, I went in there about 10, 30, 11 o'clock yesterday morning and every self-checkout line was full and had three people deep and they had two regular aisles open 
They were full and had four people deep in them, and I was just going after a bag of salt. I decided I didn't need salt that bad. I just put it back. People were getting prepared, I guess, for what has been forecast. I mean, we did. We, I went out and I eventually found salt, and I've got batteries for the lights, and I've got gas for the generator, and kerosene for the kerosene heater. I'm prepared as I've ever been prepared for one event that will come and go. And I thought to myself, how many of these people are worried about the, the, the event that when it comes, it will be eternal? It will be an eternal event that they can never go back and say, well, the next time this happens, I'm going to whatever the case is. Tell people that a storm's coming and they'll get prepared. Tell people that Jesus is coming and they do nothing to prepare for that. Their minds are not set on things above. And then finally, I want us to think about how that God is in control. Harold mentioned that in his prayer this morning around the communion table. Verse 39 and 40 of this psalm says, But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in times of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. <coughs> Can you think of any more comforting words than that? Do I need to say anything more that our salvation comes from the Lord? Just do you trust in the Lord? Do you have your mind set on things above or are they set on things of this earth? And I want to finish with these two scriptures and these are the two that I talked about that I go back at times when I, when I do let maybe I get worried. Friend of mine at the railroad, dear friend of mine, Oscar Neese, quoted these, me script, these scriptures to me years ago, and they have stuck with me since. Verses 25 and 26. It says, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. The righteous has not been forsaken. And you think about that statement today. You look back and you see where God has forsaken any person that seeks to serve him. I can't think of one single case, and I have thought about it before. can't think of one single case. And that's comforting to me. I hope it is to you as well. Deuteronomy 3.31.6 as we close up here. And the descendants, if you think about that, seed is descendants there in, in uh, 25 and 26. That's your kids and your kid, grandkids and that's your great-grandkids. Moms and dads, mamas and papas, you're setting a great example that will have benefits for your kids on down the line. And their kids, and their kids, like we talked about last week, how that it is becoming less and less important for church attendance and to serve the Lord. David says in this psalm that the righteous, their descendants, their seed will be blessed. Their seed will not be forsaken. Deuteronomy 31, 6, as we close, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is one, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. We have that comfort and courage know. So first and foremost, if you don't know Jesus, that's where your comfort comes from. By hearing the word and believing, accepting Christ as your Savior, repenting of your sins, being buried with him in the likeness of his death and baptism, raised that new creation, you receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you just move forward serving going out and being those points of light, doing those Jesus activities that he calls us to do. Now, maybe you've done that, and you realize, you know what? I've been worrying about stuff I can't change, and I've not been doing the things that I can do. Change. Accept the challenges that I have given you the past two weeks. Spend less time on your social media, equal amount of time, rather, 
equal amount of time in your Bibles and in prayer as you are on social media or television. And the other challenge for this year is to do a Jesus activity every week. And I'll give you a week to do one thing. But then what I want to do is I want to challenge you to do more than one a week. To where it gets to be where you're doing something every day. You're doing a Jesus activity every day. And think about how much impact you're going to have. We're going to sing this hymn of invitation this morning, Why Do You Wait? Number 360. I'm going to, we're going to sing the first and the third verse of this hymn. And I want to encourage you to come as we stand and sing as we, if, we have, if you have a decision to make. 360, Why Do You Wait? First and the third.